grandson of right thought. Welcome to the School of Marvelous Light, Little Flock. It's a beautiful day today. So we're going to talk about some beautiful things and feel some beautiful feelings and have beautiful thoughts. Scriptures say, rejoice. And again, I say rejoice. So in order to do that, we got to have some beautiful thoughts and some beautiful feelings, correct? All right then. All right then. Today I want to talk about family. True family. And I also want to talk about brotherly love. Because that's what makes family. Love one to another. This is why this is the instruction. A lot of people talk about the commandments of the Father and what we are to do to please Him. But we know that there's a schoolmaster that brings you up to a certain point. So just like school, you went through grades and you went up levels and then you graduated. So maybe it's kindergarten, then first, second, third, y'all you know, y'all know, up to twelfth grade, and then you graduate. And then you go to college or you go to a new teacher, a higher professor, a master. You see that? You haven't mastered anything by the time you graduate high school. <laughs> so you gotta go get your masters from a higher teacher. But you needed a schoolmaster to bring you up through those levels, didn't you? Well, the, the schoolmaster was Moses. <laughs> the law, what he taught through those 12 grades, brought you up to the master, brought you unto Christ. See? So once you get to Christ, then you're no longer being taught by the schoolmaster, are you? You've graduated. See how that goes, little flock? Now, there aren't many who have graduated because few there be that find it. There's only a few people that get the master's degree. Isn't there? Out of your school, a whole lot of people went to your school, but only a small percentage of them became masters of anything. <laughs> they let the schoolmaster be sufficient. But according to the scripture, it's not. See how that goes, little flock? It's not sufficient. And so it is with life. If you get a high school diploma, you might get a little job or maybe even a decent job. You graduated high school, you might even get a decent job. But if you want a very good job and a high paying job, then you may want to go get your master's. You see? So you can get greater benefits. You see that there? Well, the same goes with what we have just brought out of the scriptures. That the law was our schoolmaster that brought us unto Christ. And then what did Christ tell us when we reached him? He says, first through 12th grade or kindergarten through 12th, K through 12, as they say, was a heavy burden for you. You had to study a lot, had to carry a lot of books in your backpack, had to get up all early all the time, <laughs> had to do all kind of stuff. But my school is easy and light. It's easy and light. Because I'm only putting two things there. Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. Love fulfills everything that you learned. Everything that you learned was so that you could love. There wasn't any other purpose Moses was talking to you. He was telling you what he was telling you so that you could know how to love. Starting with yourself. That's why when he presented himself, he presented himself in the name of I am. So that you could know how to love I am. Love your God with your whole heart. Love I am with your whole heart. Now, if somebody says, why are you saying love I am with your whole heart? Because that's his name. When somebody talks about you, don't they say your name? If there was a husband and a wife, the husband's name was John. The husband's wife, I mean, the wife's name was Linda. And I was talking to Linda. I would say, love John with your whole heart. 
your whole mind and your whole soul. That's what I would tell her and that's what I would tell him. Love Linda with your whole heart so that he knows who I'm talking about. Well, in the case of God, you would say, love I am with your whole heart, your whole mind, and your whole soul. That means all your feelings. Love him with all your thoughts and all your feelings because that's what you are. As a man thinketh in his heart, heart is where you think and feel. So is he. Y'all need to understand this term, to think feelingly. Little flock understand that. If you are part of the elect, then you must. That's why I'm telling it to you. I'm not worried about whether what I'm saying is valuable or not. I know. You know, you guys know what I'm going to do. You know what I'm going to do. Oh my gosh. Lilac. Oh. Lilac, y'all. Mm, one of my favorites. Lavender and lilac. Ooh. All right, y'all. Back to my point. Ooh, man. But this, I'm not worried about whether what I'm saying to you is valuable. I have found that it is. So I'm sharing it. That's all this is. You see that there? So the schoolmaster that you get brought to brings you to the level of how to love. To reveal the father to you. <laughs> you see? That was the purpose. To bring you up to that knowledge of how to be like God. Because when you read in John, what does it say? God is love. So then if you want to meet God, what do you think you need to be? You need to be love. Because I am love. See that? I am love. So when you know that I am love, then you start to carry out the work that he's laid on you, which is very easy and very light. Isn't it? Oh, love. Okay. I know when I'm being loving or not. So if I'm not being loving, then I'm in error. I'm in fear. I'm in doubt, which is sin. But if I am being loving, then I always make the right choice. I always do the right thing and say the right thing because love is leading me. Love is God. So then God is leading me. God is power. Love is power. So this makes it very simple to me. If I want to be powerful, then I will become loving because our all most high power is love. You see that? So now we see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the scripture. The patriarchs, they're called. The fathers, you see. Now, when people say they serve the God of heaven, almighty God, or whatever words that they want to say, they say, I serve the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So now, in order to understand why they say those three, we need to look at those three men's lives. You see, how did they live? What did they do? What made them significant? And one thing that we'll see is that when we get to the grandson, some interesting things take place. Now, why do I say grandson? Because you have Abraham, Abraham, the father of many nations, father. Then you have Isaac, he who laughs, which is the son. And then you have Israel, Jacob, who is the grandson. You see that? Now, when the grandson comes, envy comes. Remember, I told you some things are going to come into play when the grandson comes. And why does envy come? Because there's places of, there are high places available. Do you understand that? There are high places or places of esteem that have become available. And we understand that through the story of Jacob and Esau and the blessing that came with it. See? The birthright, like I said, high esteemed places are becoming available. So the envy doesn't necessarily start. Sorry about the wind, y'all. It doesn't necessarily start when Israel comes. It starts with his mother. You see, she loves Jacob. Isaac loves Esau. She says, marry a woman of your own. Esau disobeys and does not. Jacob does. So this causes strife between the two sons. You see that there? You see that? 
So let's see what happens when he gets married, Jacob that is. We know the envy between Esau and Jacob. It's a perpetual hatred that Esau has for Jacob. Never ending perpetual hatred. Okay, so we see that has now entered. Now let's see what happens with his wives, Leah and Rachel. Leah and Rachel have enmity between them two as well. See what I'm saying? And why is that? Well, Leah envies Rachel because Jacob loves Rachel. Spends all his time with Rachel. He's in love with her. You see? So she doesn't get to spend much time with her husband. She longs for her husband. She waits patiently to see her husband while he's out there frolicking around having fun with his wife, Rachel. So the scripture says, God saw that she was hated by Jacob because you can't serve two masters, he said. You will either love one and hate the other. Well, the same goes here. You will always prefer one and reject the other one. That's what a preference is. People don't like the truth when it cuts through the bone and the marrow and it shows why you chose. Do you understand that? They just want to say, well, that was just a choice. It doesn't mean that you don't like the other person. Well, if you'd like them as much as you like the other, you'd have picked them, but you didn't pick them. So regardless of what you say, you hate that one because you didn't pick it. You love the other one and that's why you picked it. That's what God says it is. So it doesn't matter what men say. Oh, I just had a preference. Okay, that means you loved one and hated the other. You will either cling to one. Uh-huh. Y'all know the rest. Yeah. So, so it was with Jacob. He was cleaving to Rachel and leaving Leah alone. And so God understood that and blessed Leah to have children. Now, this gift that she had to bear these children and, he, and to ultimately bear the heir, which is Judah, our Messiah sprang forth from Judah. See that there? Leah's boy. So she got that blessing because God saw that she was hated by Jacob. Now, it doesn't mean that Jacob was mean to Leah. It doesn't mean that he was uh, raw to her, just curt with her and short. And that's not what it means. It doesn't mean he was unkind to her. It just means he preferred Rachel. You hear that? So now, she has the boys. Rachel sees this and envies her sister. I hope you guys hear that. What does the scripture say about envy? Envy is worse than death. Envy is terrible. You see that there? So she envied her sister because her sister was bearing children. So what did she say to Jacob? Listen close to the flock. You're gonna learn a lot today. What did she feel? She envied her and she said, Jacob, give me a child lest I die. Give me a child or I'm going to die. That's what she said. And Jacob said, am I in God's stead? <laughs> in other words, that my decision? That's Abba's decision whether you have children or not. Now that I see the envy in your heart, I can understand why you're not having any children. <laughs> because you think that'll make Jacob love you? Don't you see you're already loved by Jacob and already preferred by Jacob? I hope you guys can see all the nuances going on here. This is all going on within you and reasons why you don't feel like you're worthy of love because that's what it's always about. So Rachel says, oh, if I give him his children and give him sons, then I'll be the queen and I'll sit in the right spot and I'll be at the right hand of my husband and he'll love me because that's what Leah said. Now my husband will love me because I've given him these children. Y'all don't hear that going on in that story? So that means they're trying to earn his love or admiration or respect or whatever through acts, through works. When we read that Jacob loved Rachel before he ever had her, at least 14 years before he ever had her. So what could she do now that would make her want him? I mean, that would make him want her, excuse me. That he didn't already see that made him want her the way that he didn't work for her. That's why he worked. See, guys? <laughs> That was the reason, that was his motivation, his incentive. Oh yeah, you'll get the work done good and you'll get it done right because you really want this. Isn't that the way it is in the world? Somebody's gonna offer you great pay, you're gonna do a great job because you wanna keep getting that great pay, don't you? But if somebody pays you shitty, then you'll slack on your job. You'll half-ass do it. It's just the truth. 
But if you're getting paid swell to do the job, you want to do a good job. You want to keep them checks rolling in. See that there? So that's what Jacob did. He worked and he worked well. Because if he didn't work well, then he wouldn't have got Rachel. Y'all see that there? So there's a lot of nuances going on here. And it's about loving, getting the love of the Father. Sitting in that right spot. So now, back to Rachel and Leah. They're envying one another for different reasons. One for the children and one for having the, the attention of the husband. You see? So now we go to, we see Jacob and Esau have the envy between them. We see that the sisters have the envy between them. But Abba has his chosen. You see that there? And that would be Jacob in this scenario. That would be Leah to bear Judah in this scenario. Now, Rachel, when she says, lest I die, does she die? In childbirth, isn't it ironic? Give me a child or else I'll die. So she gets the child, but then she dies, giving birth to the child. That child is Benjamin. So amongst the 12 tribes of Israel, there's a tribe out there that knows not his mother, that did not have his mother. And for a large portion of his life, didn't have his brother either. That would be Joseph. So he was a set apart, oddball, amongst his brothers. His mother passed away giving birth to him. She didn't even name him Benjamin. That's the name his father gave him, guys. But what did his mother call him? Benoni, which means son of sorrow. <laughs> the irony, as she's passing away, I got the thing that I asked for and it cost me my life. power of life and death is in the tongue give me child lest I die and it all came out of envy that made her speak that so then the root of it was envy you see that and so do we see that envy carry on between the brothers well who was the first king of Israel look at how it goes guys look at the results and the fruits that would be Saul mighty Benjamite first king of Israel he had to concede his throne to Yehuda, David. And how did he feel about having to do that? He envied and hated David and he wanted to kill him because envy is worse than death. He wanted to kill David and he sought to kill him. But what did David have to do? Judah, that is, see, it's Benjamin and Judah all over again. He had to show compassion to his brother. He had to remember that his brother was motherless. He would, he would, he lacked a bit of comfort. So he had to show that to his brother. And we see this same principle in the mighty Benjamite in the New Testament. Saul. Same name. Slaying his brothers. Thinking he's doing a God of service. Hunting them and chasing them down with great zeal. Misdirected. So let Judah come to you, brother. And let him put his hand on your shoulder. And say, I got you, bro. I'll be your comforter. I'll tell you about your mother because I know her. Y'all hear the beauty of that today? Can you see little Benjamin sitting under his big brother Judah's arm, asking him about his mother? And Judah's like, my daddy, man, <laughs> he loved your mother more than my mother, if I'm honest with you. He adored your mother. Loved her. You see there? And we see that when he goes to see Joseph, who was Benjamin's protector when Benjamin had to leave? Because because Jacob didn't want Benjamin to leave, did he? He didn't want Benjamin to go. But somebody stepped forward and said, I'll be his protector. I'll look out for him. And who was that, brothers? Of course it was Huda. It was Judah. And so when they became a nation, and became a kingdom. Judah kept his arm over his brother, son of the right hand, and pulled him to his right hand and said, you're gonna stay in my land with me. You're gonna be a Jew like me. What does Saul of the New Testament call himself? A Jew of the Jews. 
we're going to be one. I'm going to always look out for you and always going to have your back. That's brotherly love, isn't it? Isn't it? It's the lesson is always there. It's about envy. What made Judah and them do what they did to Joseph? So you see why Judah's trying to redeem himself? He know what he did the first time to Joseph, Rachel's son. They know what they did to him. So he said, okay, if I let this happen to his other beloved son, Benjamin, then my dad going to go, he's going to die sorrowful. He's going to die sorrowful. So let me protect him. Let me look out for him. And so shall it be this day, brothers, to remember our infirmities, where we came from, what made us what we are. And me, from the tribe of Judah, understand my place and understand what I'm supposed to tell my brothers, which is you are supposed to look out for yours. You are supposed to put your arm around your brothers and always care for them and comfort them. Always be there for your brothers. Don't get caught up in yourself and thinking about your position and your place because that place makes you a servant to your brothers. Yahusha taught us that as the head of our tribe. And along the way, we've forgotten it, brothers. This message ain't for everybody. I told you that. This message are from the elect that are scattered abroad, the 12 tribes of Israel. That's who it's for. Trying to make tribes of the world when you need to reconnect to the tribes that I've already gave you, your beloved brothers and sisters that are right around you. We see it. It doesn't matter if you're male or female. Envy destroys. How do you think Leah felt when her sister died? Oh, yippee, skippy, my sister's dead. Now my husband's going to cleave to me and be up under me all day. This is great. Is that how you think she felt? Maybe she might have thought that at some point and had to repent of that thought. Damn, if my sister wasn't here, I'd have my husband all to myself. We knew that was her desire. But she bore it. She bore it. And so she was buried with her husband, even though she wasn't the preferred wife. She got the spot because she bore it. Where was Leah's envy? If you read it, you know. So that's what it's about today, little flock. It's understanding that it's about loving one another and supporting one another. Not looking at each other to look at what you can uh, tear down not to look at one another to see what you can blaze or roast. I'm an Israelite. I grew up around Israelites. I know that's how y'all are to one another. Y'all like to talk down on one another about money. Y'all like to talk down at, on each other about the kind of shoes that y'all wore to school. Y'all will sit at the lunch table and talk about another one of your brothers because of the shoes that he got on. You don't hear that? <laughs> and everything that y'all point at each other to talk about are things that some other nation gave you to make you envious of one another because he wants you to be like him he's the envious one with the perpetual hatred who is the one that's on that money that y'all roast each other about just as it was in the days of Yahusha when he said look on the money whose picture is on there Rome's okay look on the money today whose picture is on there yours so why do you laugh at your brother if you have more of that than him? Why? As if you're some great man because you stacked up somebody else's inscription. That makes you great? Okay, so you, didn't, you don't have your own inscription on paper, but you stacked up somebody else's inscription that they made, and that makes you great? So what about the man whose inscription it is? What is he? Hmm? Answer me that. The man's inscription who's on there. If you're great for stacking up his inscription, then what the hell is he? And then your master come and say, render to Caesar the things that are his. Render to God the things that are his. 
and people scratch their heads and don't understand what he's saying there. Y'all know exactly what he's saying. You know exactly what he's saying. But your hearts are so full of envy for one another, trying to one up your brother. How does that help you? I'll tell you like this, there's a plantation. There's a man sitting on the porch, sipping a mint julep, fanning himself with his hat. That's the master of the house. He's getting his feet rubbed by some little pickaninny. And in the field, there are 20 to 30 slaves out there in the field. Now one of the slaves has picked 500 pounds of cotton. The other one has picked three. The one that picked five turned and looked at the three and said, I'm better than you. You ain't shit. <laughs> Look how much cotton I picked today. Look how much you got. You ain't got shit. Look how much I got. And you're telling me that that makes sense to you all? Even though the one with the mint julep fanning himself with the hat is the one who has subjected you both to that situation. Proving that you are brothers. That's why you in the same case. Mm, 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 mm. Can y'all hear this message today? When the grandson comes, here comes envy. Keep the grandson as your template when you read the Bible, and then you'll see envy always there. Let's, let, let's, let's put the template on here, over the Bible here, the grandson template. God, Adam, who was the son of God, the scripture says, in Abel, did envy come? Hey God, why do you have respect to his sacrifice and not mine? Kill, kill, kill. So then I ain't lying. So then I'm not lying. Okay, let's see. Solomon comes to go take the throne. Adonaiah. Hey, I think I need to be king. Some of y'all loyal followers, be loyal to me now. Because I'm going to be the king. <sighs> Skeet. Let's slide the template over a little bit more. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Hey, why does that guy stole my blessing? Rightly is he named Jacob. When my father dies, I'm going to kill him. Skeet. I don't know what you guys want me to say. It's always going to be there over and over and over and over and over again. So, so it is this day. The grandson of right thought born. What is the grandson of right thought talking about right now today? He's talking about the 12 tribes of Israel need to love one another, support one another, and be a comfort to one another. Stop looking outside of your nation to somebody else to comfort you for what you've been through for the last hundreds of years. They will not, have not, cannot. The Bible says they have a perpetual hatred. The Bible also says that all the nations came together, looked at you, and said, we would like to cut them off. That's a hatred that multiple nations have toward you. Cut them off that the name of Israel be no more in remembrance. That's how we want that nation. We don't want them around. So then it's best that you turn and look at one another and says, all right, let's band together. Let's keep the master's commandment at last. Love I am. Are you loving I am if I am has been turned into a slave by somebody else? Do you love I am when somebody else has changed your name from what it truly is to a lie and made their names your names? You ain't loving I am then, are you? Not if you're lying to I am every damn day, looking in the mirror, forgetting what you saw and walking away thinking that what you saw was good. Mm, 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 mm. See what the grandson of right thought is telling you? You see? Told you, Legos, Logos, Legos, Logos. Love your, love your neighbors. That's the law. Judah will never cease. David will never cease to have a lawgiver from come from between his knees. <laughs> Do y'all hear this today? It won't stop. So that's what the branch is here to fulfill. The not stopping of that covenant promise. You see? 
I'm proving that God fulfilled it. I'm proving it to you that he fulfilled it, saving the people that had the lie on their name. What nation of people on the earth had a lie put on their name by somebody else? I know a lot of people act silly when I say that, so let me just throw something out here. Let's see. There was a people that was enslaved in America, and they were called colored. They were also called black. They were also called African American. Now, when you have wisdom, you know that a lie only lasts for so long. So once the lie wears off, you have to give a new lie in its place. That's why they were called colored. And then it was changed to black. And then it was changed to African American. Because the lie cannot stand. If we were black, then we would have always been called black and it would never have changed. If we were really colored, then we would have always been called that and it would have never changed because the truth changes not. So how does this people have a name that changes every 20 to 30 years? Can you explain that to me? I don't need you to, but I'm wondering if you're humble enough to. See, because what I'm asking, anybody from any nation, I'm asking you, see? Are you too stupid where you haven't lived on the earth long enough to know that the Negroes were enslaved? You don't know that is what you're trying to tell me? Oh my God, are you too stupid? Well, don't you have to be stupid to not know that information? Today's day and age, it's everywhere. <laughs> Most of us learned it in school. Most of us know it is the point. You see that there? So this can't be denied what I'm saying. It can't be. All you can do is submit to it. And that what he says is going to happen in the end. All knees are going to bow. All tongue will confess as well. All of them will. It doesn't matter if you want to or not. That's why when he shows up, all the tribes of the earth mourn. Doesn't say they celebrate, even though that's what they claim they're going to do. So then there's a reason they're not going to be celebrating. Do you know why that reason is? Because he caught them unawares. He caught them with envy in their hearts. He caught them with hatred in their hearts. In other words, he caught them not doing unto others as you would have them do unto you. Would you make somebody go out in the hot ass sun all day and pick 500 pounds of cotton for you without giving them a dime for it? Would you do that? Okay, well there are people on the earth who did do it, aren't there? No one can deny this. So y'all all say y'all love Jesus. Even the people that were forcing people to pick the cotton said they love Jesus. Well, this you're, you're, the one you say, Jesus, he said, love your neighbors as yourself. So then you just showed the whole white world how to treat you. You ones that enslaved. You ones that made people pick cotton for free. You ones that beat the skin off of people's back and changed their name and stole their identities and put them, scattered them all over the earth. All you did was tell God how you want your tribe to be treated. So then what does the scripture say? He who leadeth into captivity, y'all can try to change it, switch it, dip it, flip it, crip it, tip it, chip it, and every damn thing else. He who leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. I don't know. It didn't say that. Isn't that what it says? Okay, well, what about this other scripture here? I'll give you a minute to collect yourself before I tell you what it says. Because you're about to get bunked on your head until you go flying back down in your hole like whack-a-mole. So I'll give you a second to collect yourself. What does the scripture mean when it says, They shall take them captives whose captives they were. What does that mean? Let me spread it out on the table so you can see it good. If you were taken captive by some people, then now you're going to rise up and take them captive. So then it all goes together like a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Even if you don't like it, it still goes together. <laughs> it still goes together. Okay. No lies in it. No changing in it because it doesn't ever have to change. This is about brotherly love and removing the envy out of my tribes of people. I'm the branch. I purge. That's what I do because that's what a branch does. People try to understand this name, the man whose name is the branch. 
they have all kinds of philosophies and all kinds of ideas of what they think it means. Some people say, branch just means descendant grandson. Okay, that's why I'm called grandson. That means I have to be somebody's grandchild. So then that means I'm a descendant of somebody. So then you're right. It does mean that. What else does it mean? It means to purge. Did you know that? And then if you say, no, it doesn't. Okay, well then read the Old Testament and see if that's what God uses to purge a thing. See, if that's what Moses used in the Old Testament. Yahushua said, I come to fulfill the law. So then nothing changes. Not one jot, not one damn tittle. So purging with a branch is the way God purges. See that there? Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Did you hear that in the Psalms? What's the hyssop David is talking about? And why is he talking about it if it has changed from Moses' day? That's because it hasn't changed. It's the same thing that purges. So doesn't it make perfect, I mean exact perfect sense that if Abba wanted to rid you of the weeds that are in your mind and in your heart, he would send you a branch? Or he would send you the man whose name is the branch? Makes perfect sense to me. He shall purge them and make them white. Who shall purge them? The branch is going to purge the sons of Levi as well. That's why I'm talking to the 12 tribes the way that I am. Y'all have been running around joining all these damn camps, thinking that you're unified, thinking that you've become one in Christ, when that is the furthest from the damn truth. Those are traps that have been set up by your damn enemy. And it's about time that y'all realize that and come out to the wilderness where the true Israelites are. The ones that ain't seeking to make merchandise of you. The ones who know that the Passover is a solemn assembly. Do you understand the word solemn? But when you go to these camps, what do you see them do? You see them cook fancy dinners and wear fancy clothes and have fashion shows and lights and cameras. Does that look solemn to you? You hear that branch knocking them on their head? For you, for you that don't feel it, it's because you're not guilty. But the ones who are guilty of what I've just said, they feel it. And the sad part about it is most of them won't repent of it. They'll just envy me for saying it. They'll just get mad at me for yelling. They'll just say he cussed. They'll just say, who does he think he is? He talks like a raving madman. Thank you for the compliment. I like when people call me things that they call Yahusha. I love it. Why wouldn't I? What do I attain to be? Who do I attain to be like? They don't want you telling this, but we have no unfruitful, we have no dealings with unfruitful works of darkness. Ignorance is darkness, guys. Unfruitful works of ignorance. Y'all hear darkness and think boogie boogie, boogie man gonna jump out with Candyman alongside and Freddy Cougar too. And Chucky might run in behind him with his little knife in his hand. I'll stump Chucky's ass down with my boot. <laughs> Being silly right there. But I'll kick his ass too. Because that's not true. Darkness means ignorance. So we expose that. They're leading the flock ignorantly astray. The flock think that's good. When they see it, they say, wow, prosper. They're prospering. We're eating good food and having good brotherhood and fellowship like the Bible says. But it's all about outward show. If it isn't, then why do they have a thing called fashion show? To have a show, you got to be showing some shit. Abba's not the God of showing nothing. He's invisible. He's a spirit. So how do you recognize God? Truth and love. That's how you recognize him. Because that's what he is. I don't need to see a form. To know when I'm being loved. I don't need to see a shape. When I know that it, I'm hearing the truth being told to me. I don't need to see it. Because that don't require no faith. But what we're doing over here at the School of Marvelous Light. Every bit of it requires faith. Because we're going to gather together. Whether you all like it or not. You can be rebellious and hard headed to what we're doing here. All you want. It won't stop it from taking place. It won't. 
Y'all are going to get tired of not being loved. You're going to get tired of chasing after vanity. And I was going to shut it all damn down right in front of your face to show you that you were worshiping other nations by all of those things that you stacked up. Funny. Funny, funny. That proved that you were in idolatry. Who do you think Abba brought the Israelites out to the wilderness for? What do you think he put them in that environment for? To teach them how to rely on him, an invisible God. It is impossible to please him without faith. <laughs> so you must believe that he is, though you can't see him. Blessed are those who have not seen yet believe. And y'all think I'm joking. I'm not joking. I don't have time for that when it comes to the truth. Even when I am joking, I'm telling the truth because that's how important the truth is. It should always come forth. Because if it doesn't come forth, lies tend to start coming out. We don't want that. So we overcome evil with good because we know evil is always present. And I wish you guys would accept that within yourself so you stop pointing the fingers at somebody else. You think when you pointed your finger at your classmate with the busted shoes that you were better. Maybe to men you were, but to God, he rejected you. He hated your heart in that moment. So what in the hell is the more value? Your stupid ass friends laughing like hyenas around you because that's what they are? Or the master sitting there like a lion looking at you, ready to rip you asunder and give your portion to somebody else? Mm. Mm. So y'all just gotta know that today, family. It's always gonna be envy. It's always gonna be jealousy among your own. And how you overcome that is by understanding where it come from and why. So then you can deal with the issue because the envious never are telling you why they are. Because they don't want you to know why they are. Because then that will make you seem better than them. They don't want that even though that's why they're envious. Isn't it unique? God is not the God of confusion. But did you hear all that? Envy confuses you, doesn't it? It makes you look at somebody you can't stand. You can't stop looking at them. That's envy. And that's sick. It makes you stalk. <laughs> that's what it makes you do. Envy. But the envious are always saying that someone else is hating them. Oh, Jacob tricked me. He's wrong. See? See that there? So like I said, we could talk about this all day, little fly, as you can see. But we've got a little long time, almost about, what, 45 minutes now? So y'all be blessed today. And look at one another with great compassion. The way that Judah looked at Benjamin and put his arm around him. Protected him when they went back to Egypt. Consider your brothers today the same way. Understanding their estate. My brother didn't have no mother, man. So he didn't, have a, he didn't really have a comforter. You know? When he get that mother smiling at him as he grew and took his first steps, she was gone already. I had my mother there to do it for me. So let me understand that when my brother gets mad. <laughs> let me be a mother to him in those situations the best that I can. Y'all understand that today? It ain't hard. All right, now. Sulwan, Mr. Allah. Y'all be blessed today, little fly.